Welcome. Hello, everyone. And so welcome to the uh, the next talk. And the speaker for this uh, session is uh, uh, Pratosh. Uh, so Pratosh received his uh, PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 2015 uh, in the area of temporal uh, data analysis and applied machine learning. And in fact, he submitted his PhD thesis in a record time of three years right after his uh, BTEC. And subsequently, he worked in corporate research labs, uh, including Xerox Research India, Philips Research, and also a startup in uh, the US. And uh, then he joined IIT Delhi as an assistant professor in the uh, computer technology group uh, at uh, Electrical Engineering. And his current research interests include uh, informative prayer guided uh, representation learning, deep generative models, cross domain learning, and their applications. Right? And he has published in all uh, major uh, uh, conferences. And so, Pratosh, over to you. So am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. OK, yeah. Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks, Professor uh, uh, Ravindran, for such a warm introduction. Uh, so the, we are, my clock shows uh, 12 of 39 now. So how much time do we have so that I can set my stop clock? <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe 25 minutes. 25 minutes? OK. Yeah. okay. Okay, so so we don't have questions in between, right? So it's no, no, only at the end. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, right. So let me just project my screen and right. So is my screen uh, visible? Yes, yes. We can okay. go to full screen. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to go to full screen. Right. Okay. So uh, hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you for. Uh, attending sun and thanks uh, uh, acm india chapter for inviting me uh, so uh, i'll spend uh, the rest of 25 minutes in uh, <clears throat> talking about uh, uh, some of the recent work uh, that we did in the area of uh, regularized uh, auto encoders uh, for generative modeling so what i'll be doing is i'll be introducing to the idea of uh, regularized auto encoders and uh, <clears throat> and introduce you to a couple of uh, important problems you know that make it uh, uh, not comparable to say other kinds of generative models such as uh, adversarial networks, and uh, we'll try to address those problems uh, using a few algorithms. And by the way, this work was uh, done to, uh, in collaboration with Professor Himan Shivasnani at TFR and Professor Parag Singla at IIT Delhi with my students. Okay, so here is a uh, an overview of what a regularized autoencoder is. Okay, so I'm, I'll be talking about uh, regularized autoencoders, uh, also called as RAEs uh, from now on. Okay, uh, as generative models. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that the given you have uh, some samples that are drawn uh, IID from a distribution, uh, which I call PDX, right? So you learn to sample from PDX, which is the uh, uh, problem for all generative models in general. Okay, so now how do you how do you solve it in in the context of uh, regularized autoencoders? You, you assume that uh, there exists a latent variable model or an underlying latent distribution, which I call as uh, PZ, okay? And uh, you induce a model, which I call as P theta x, uh, which is given as uh, integral uh, P theta x given z, P z d z, which is the generative data distribution, right? And you have two networks, which are uh, parameterized uh, neural networks, uh, two functions, if I may call them, uh, the encoder network and the decoder network. Encoder is generally represented as a uh, uh, e phi and the parameters are phi and uh, the, the parameters of decoders are theta, theta. So these encoders and decoders uh, can be probabilistic uh, in the sense that uh, they output the parameters of a given distribution or they can be deterministic in the sense that they just uh, output the samples uh, of a given distribution. Now, what you do generally is that you assume that this PZ, which is the latent or the hidden uh, variable, uh, adheres to a certain distribution, which is uh, uh, in a in, in lot of cases assumed to be a normal distribution with zero mean isotropic Gaussian distribution. Okay, and, and here is the idea. So what you basically do is that uh, you take the samples uh, drawn from PD, which are the input samples, and give it as an input to the encoder. And uh, the, in the bottleneck bottleneck layer, uh, which uh, which uh, which is the output of the encoder, so uh, you make the encoder output the samples from a distribution which is called Q phi z given x, which is also called the variational uh, distribution, right? So given an x, uh, this encoder will uh, give you the samples from Q phi z given x. If it's a deterministic, it will just throw a sample from it, or if it's probabilistic, it will it will output the parameters of this distribution. Then you take the samples from this distribution and uh, give it to uh, a network called decoder, which would try to reconstruct the data or 
uh, output the samples from uh, x given z or p x cap uh, uh, p theta x cap uh, uh, sorry p theta x cap given z right so basically what you do i mean just one more trick uh, which this is a this is a general auto encoder where you just give the data and you want the data to be uh, reproduced at your output but in the case of regularized auto encoders you play a small trick where you have a, a, a regularizer right on the uh, the output of the uh, encoder uh, which is also the bottleneck layer the regularizer is is mostly in this uh, uh, form where you take a divergence measure or a distributional divergence measure and you learn your q right in such a way that the divergence i mean the, the the distributional divergence measure between the learned latent distribution which is q phi z q phi of z and the the prior that you have assumed on your uh, latent variable which is phi z which is mostly the normal distribution is minimized right so you have dual objective when you are solving these kinds of problems where the first objective is to minimize the reconstruction loss or you want your data to be reconstructed at the decoder and the second last term is that you want the distributional divergence metric between the learned latent distribution and the true latent distribution to be as less as possible now suppose you you are able to optimize this objective jointly okay what happens is that after you have trained this kind of a regular auto encoder you can you can throw away the throw away the encoder and since your q phi right which is the output of the encoder uh is 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 now following a gaussian distribution all you need to do is sample from a gaussian distribution and give that as an input to your decoder network which now gives you new samples from pdx right and that is how a decoder network uh, now starts acting like a generative generator network and which 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 gives you samples according to p theta x right so this is the overview of uh, how a regularized auto encoder work it is a regularized it is called a regularized auto encoder for obvious reasons right i mean it is an auto encoder that is regularized with a certain uh, distributional divergence measure okay now so a little bit of details uh, uh, in terms of math so basically uh, there are lots of models uh, starting from a variational auto encoder and beta vae info vae versus strains auto encoder adversarial auto encoder all of these fall in under this category of regularized auto encoders so basically the idea is you see in any generative model the final goal is to make your p theta x which is the distribution that your model is learning to be very close to pdx which is the true data generating distribution correct so one nice uh, world view of all these raes is that uh, that all these raes including vae wae and everything are trying to minimize the uh, the uh, some kind of uh, dis distributional divergence between p d of x which is the true data generating distribution and p theta of x which is the the distribution that the model is trying to learn basically what you need to do is tweak your parameters of the model theta such that p theta comes as close to pd x as possible so how do you say that mathematically so kl divergence is one self distributional metric right divergence metric if you use kl divergence the objective now becomes a uh, minimization of the kl divergence between pd of x which is the data true data distribution and p theta of of x which is the model uh, the, the distribution that the model is learning with a constraint that your model adheres to this equation where it is a latent variable model okay right so if you write it you just expand it you know you will get these uh, uh, four terms you know the kl this uh, divergence uh, uh, breaks down to these four terms where uh, if you see um, maybe you can come to this equation or oh, just to see this equation where uh, if you see i mean uh, i I'll, I'll just come to what is elbow in a moment so this the first term that you see is nothing but right the the likelihood of the generated data under the encoder right so log p theta x given z is the likelihood of the generated data under the encoder which is nothing but the reconstruction error the second term is the di distributional divergence metric of between the prior that we have imposed on the latent uh, uh, space and the the latent distribution that the uh, encoder is learning so this is the regularization term this is the auto encoding term right so what i'm trying to say is that if you try to minimize the divergence uh, metric between the true data and the data uh, the, the distribution that the model is learning it would basically boil down to you know optimizing two terms which is nothing but regular i mean the auto encoding with a regularization 
okay so by the way uh, if you start from a kl divergence you know you cannot directly optimize for the kl divergence because of uh, an intractable term here which is always uh, non negative so people generally optimize a lower bound on the on the kl instead which is called the evidence lower bound okay right so if this is the story of vae the variational auto encoders and by the way this distribution that the encoder is uh, outputting is called the variational distribution because it uh, acts like a proxy variational proxy for the uh, true uh, latent posterior right so this is the story of vae and its uh, and its friends uh, while there is another class of regularized auto encoders that are called uh, the adversarial auto encoders or worse strains auto encoders here uh the if you notice the only difference between a vae and its variants and the regularized i'm sorry the the the, the resistance auto encoders and adversarial auto encoders is that uh, our starting point changes the the the, 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 the distribution or divergence metric that we use to optimize our model changes in the case of vae and its variants it would be kl uh, okay and in the case of wae or aae it would be the resistance distance when i i assume that uh, audience are aware of what resistance distance mean when it is roughly it is a divergence metric between uh, two distributions which have some nicer properties compared to kl divergence and others okay so basically what you want to do is you want to optimize or minimize the the versus strains distance between the the actual data distribution and the distribution that the model is learning and it can be shown that it adheres to uh, this kind of an infimum uh, uh, optimization problem which is again sorry it is a constrained optimization problem and uh, to make it unconstrained you just uh, write down the lagrangian if you write the lagrangian this is how it is and if you see this is exactly you know very very similar to what the the objective that we were having with a vae where the first term okay i'll, I'll just I'll define what this c is c is any measurable cost function right i mean uh, between x and d theta of z so what is d theta of z it is nothing but the output of the decoder now what am i saying here is in the first term i'm saying that uh, that let us assume for a moment that c can be a, a msc or a minimum uh, uh, least square error kind of metric i'm saying that the least square error uh, mean square error between x which is the input and the output of my encoder decoder right have to be minimized right which is nothing but the auto encoding term what is the second term here second term is again a divergence metric between the the prior uh, sorry the the the, the uh latent distribution that the encoder is learning and the true latent uh uh distribution that we have so wae or the versus strains auto encoder and adversarial auto encoder both of them again fall into the category of regularized auto encoders uh, but if you notice just for the details the difference between uh, a vae and a wae is that the regularization here is between pz and the conditional posterior while the regularization here is between the uh, the aggregated the posterior and the prior okay right so now this is the ambit of uh, the regularized auto encoder so what do we do in this you know let me just skip some background so basically in this talk uh, we 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 answer two questions you know one what is the effect of the dimensionality of the latent space on such regularized auto encoders based generative models and see in most of the cases we assume that our pz are the and the true latent distribution uh, is a normal distribution right i mean is, is it is it good do we actually have any other optimality in terms of the prior that we assume for the uh, latent distribution see the motivation comes from the fact that uh, whenever you are doing you know bayesian uh, 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 analytics on data the kind of prior that you assume uh, in 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 in, uh, in in bayesian decision making actually has a lot of uh, impact on what your how your model performs right i mean that is where uh, the motivation comes from right so we did a small experiment where we just did a simple thing where we took the mnist data set and uh, we changed the dimensionality of the bottleneck or the latent uh, layer the output of the encoder we varied it from you know 0 to 80 and we saw that uh, in, on all the data set fid is a metric that would uh, 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 quantify how good your generated data is we saw that that metric always follows a u curve in the sense that uh, that there seems to be an optimal number right of the latent dimensionality uh, that would give you the best effect by the way lower the better if you have low low fid means that your generated data is as close to the real data as possible okay so this was the observation that we made you know this was an empirical observation so what is going on here right so to explain that uh, we have a, a pretty good theoretical results where we say that okay let us assume that nature is generating our data in this manner you know where 
there exists a true latent distribution, right? Uh, uh, that is sampled from uh, an isotropic Gaussian again, uh, uh, which is an n-dimensional isotropic Gaussian. Let us call it uh, Z tilde. Now, nature is uh, taking a function f, uh, which is trying to map uh, the isotropic uh, Gaussian distribution in Rn to uh, uh, distribution in Rd, right? I mean, that's how you get the data. Now, we make uh, uh, some benign assumptions on how our uh, uh, generative function should be. And here, what we show in, in these two theorems is that, see, if you, this is the objective of your regularized autoencoder, we show that your regularized autoencoder, the objective of your regularized autoencoder can reach its optima if and only if the, the assumed dimensionality of your latent space, right, uh, which we call as M in your model, exactly matches with the dimensionality of the actual latent space. You know, this is that point. Okay, that's what we show with uh, some rigorous proofs and so on. Uh, I'll give you a general idea of you know, what we are talking about, right? So basically, what we say is the following. If you, uh, I mean, mostly in deep learning, you know, we make this uh, uh, hypothesis called the manifold hypothesis, where we say that, uh, see, MNIST is lying in a 784 dimensional real space, right? But the effective uh, data of the MNIST data set actually doesn't lie in a 784 dimensional data space, but it lies in a lower dimensional manifold in the higher dimensional space. You know, that's what everybody agrees. Now, if you look into it as uh, suppose your MNIST is in a three-dimensional space, uh, 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 then you can look into your data as some thread that is there in the three-dimensional space, which is a one-dimensional manifold in your three-dimensional space. So all that is that, that we are saying in our theorem says that suppose your data is actually right lying in a very very low dimensional space uh, 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 compared to what it actually lies in sorry manifold compared to what what it actually lies in then there is no way that you match the the the, the distribution that your encoder is uh, imposing to an isotropic gaussian distribution in that higher dimension it makes sense right i mean unless you have some other source of noise that comes into the uh, 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 model, uh, some other source of stochasticity, even then there are problems, I'll not go to them. Basically, we are saying that, you know, see, if you define a Gaussian distribution in a three-dimensional space, an isotropic Gaussian distribution in a three-dimensional space, there is no way that you are trying to match, try, I mean, you're, you're matching that to uh, 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 an encoder that is trying to put a data that is effectively is, is on a thread, which is a one-dimensional space in three-dimensional space to a three-dimensional Gaussian distribution. That's That's what it is. Okay, so to solve this problem, so now the question is because you do not know what is the ambient latent dimensionality a priori, right? I mean, you don't know what what is the actual uh, manifold of the data a priori. How do you solve this problem? Because uh, everybody who has worked on generative models know that uh, these autoencoders or VAE kinds of models never give you FIDs that are comparable to GANs, and GANs are known to be notoriously difficult to be training, right? I mean, so what do we do about it? So we have come up with uh, two uh, solutions, independent solutions. You know, one which we recently published in uh, UAI, and the second one we are uh, submitting to AAAI. The first one we call as Mask AAE. A pretty simple idea. So where what we do is that, <clears throat> okay, let me explain what this diagram is. This is encoder. This is decoder. And in an adversarial autoencoder or a persistence autoencoder, uh, to minimize the the divergence metric or the regularization, you also have a critique network because we use resistance distance to minimize the divergence between the true latent and the learned latent, okay? Now, what we do here is that just before the, uh, the, the encoded output goes into the decoder as an input, right? And uh, the input for the critic network that also goes as an input to the critic network, we multiply with a, a, a function that we call as the mask. Okay, which we force it to go to, uh, force to take binary values, and I'll just uh, not withstanding the details, I'll just go to the idea. So basically, what we do is that we force the network right explicitly to mask or zero out some of the dimensions of the latent space, right? So that way, what happens is you know this figure, if you see uh, the the white uh, the dimensions which are represented by white color are the ones that are active, and the ones that are with the black color are the ones that are inactive. So while training, what happens is the divergence metric between the latent space, the assumed latent space and the true latent space, uh, it has a better chance of going to zero because uh, we are we are forcing the mask to do the I mean to to 
uh, uh, zero out the dimensions that are superfluous, right? So before you make this as an input to the decoder and the critic, you multiply it with a learnable mask, right? So that's what we do. Uh, and yeah, the, the lack of the time, I'll just show you one result and we'll move on. See, what happens here is uh, that, um, <clears throat> right, maybe I'll show you the, this one. Yeah, so here, what we do is for MNIST data set, right? I mean, it is more or less assumed that the, uh, the the uh, actual uh, ambient latent dimensionality is around 10 to 15 or something. What we do is we start with a model capacity of 32, right? And 64 and 110, which is the actual latent dimensionality. I mean, assume latent dimensionality. As we train, you know, what you can see is the, as a function of iterations, the masks, right? All the dimensions, uh, ex except for the ones that are equal to the ambient latent dimensionality survive and the rest of the one just die down. See, irrespective of the initial assume latent dimension, you assume 32, you end up getting 11, you assume 64, you end up getting 13, you assume 110, you end up getting 11, and the rest of the ones are pushed to zero, right? There's another, you know, uh, we just plot the covariance matrix of uh, the, the learned prior, and you can see that uh, while for a WAE, where you have full-blown covariance, you have a lot of covariance and the diagonal, off diagonal entries, and you see all the diagonals active, in our model, you only have no, 11 or 12 uh, uh, non-zero diagonal entries and even off diagonal entries are zero. And this has, I mean, the, 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 the effect of this is that you get a very, very nice FID on the standard data sets you know, that, are, that are actually comparable to uh, GANs. Okay. Yeah, so this is one idea. The other idea is, um, yeah. So now the question is, right, why only mask? You no, know, uh, why only have a learnable mask? You know, why don't you have an entire, the entire, uh, prior to be learned okay so here is a diagram where we show that if the two latent space uh, has a, 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 a structure like this so if you uh, try to learn it using a, a, a vae where the latent space is gaussian by construction you end up getting a gaussian latent space which makes the F F F fid we call it fd because we are we are using synthetic data here Fresh's distance is very very high right for a wae if you assume a gmm prior Right, which is more expressive, you know, closer to the true prior, you get a better uh, FID than that. Okay, so again, the same thing happens. You know, uh, by looking at it, one should not conclude that always expressive priors are better. Right, if the data is actually Gaussian, if the two latent space is actually Gaussian, using a more expressive prior is detrimental as well. Right, I mean, you should not use a priors oblivious data. You should set your prior that is as close to data as possible. Based on this observation, you know, what we just did was we played a small trick where we just uh, alter the objective of a regularized autoencoder that would have one more state space uh, in terms of learnable latent space. So now we are saying, you now why do you fix PC? So you learn the latent space that you need as in when you are training. Okay, so this is what it is. So now, um, yeah, so this is the generative function that I'm talking about, the F uh, that is completely hidden with us. Nature generates it like this and you have encoder. Uh, which maps it to RM and you have decoder that again maps it to RD. What we do here is that we have another neural network that we call as G, uh, <clears throat> G psi that would take that would that would take another uh, uh, let, uh, another random variable uh, at, uh, in, in our M dash dimensions and creates the latent space you know, that is needed. Now, what do we do is while we are training this, you know, there are multiple paths of training. One path is, of course, uh, de from decoder to encoder, uh, where you want the, the auto encoding to be done. The other path is uh, from GSI, you know, from the critic of GSI to the encoder. So here, what we are saying is, set your psi, which is the latent space also, such that, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you latch on to the prior, you know, the so-called optimal prior that you need uh, to, to get better numbers. Right, I'll just show you this figure. Yeah, so here you see, so uh, with that algorithm, the latent space that we have learned, while there is a, a, a GMM kind of latent space happens to be GMM, and when there is a Gaussian latent space happens to be Gaussian. And you, you see that in, in, in our model, which we call as the flex uh, autoencoder, uh, flex AE, you know, <laughs> uh, to be fancy, you know, you, you need fancy names for these days to get your papers accepted, right? So the, the flex AE model always gives you a lesser uh, FT. Not only that, the latent space that it is learning, right, at the end of the training actually matches with the true latent space. So we are not, see, if you fix your latent space oblivious to data, uh, when the data was a multimodal thing, if you fix it to Gaussian, 
you are you are you do bad and if it's gaussian if it's it to a, a, a more expressive thing then also you do bad because you are trying to uh, match a gaussian to a gmm and now in our case if the prior itself is learnable if it's a gmm let it learn a gmm if it's a gaussian let it learn a gaussian by and and, and giving you a bit, be, better uh, recon, i mean better generation uh, thereof yeah so some of the numbers again you know if uh, if some of you have worked on the uh, uh, gyan literature you know that the state of the art fid is on mnist for gyan is around 3 we are able to get it to 4 and cpar is again around 28 or 25 we are uh, we are uh, we are close to 30, 40 and 60 i mean by the way uh even though i mean even though these are <clears throat> giving you better state of the art numbers gyan still give you around 30 fid for cfr we are still 62 i mean there are other problems uh, the open problems that uh, that one has to solve in these uh, in this uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in this framework and celeb we are uh, comparable to gyan <clears throat> see i did not mention that there is one very big advantage associated with the uh, the the uh, regularized auto encoders compared to a network like gyan where the training is extremely Uh, uh stable you know uh people who have trained gans know how difficult it is to get them make uh, generate good numbers but here it is very straight forward yeah so there's some uh, some experiment to show that the train gate space is smooth and all that you know you have <coughs> um uh, regular latent interpolations and so on yeah i'll i'll be finishing in uh, uh, 10 15 seconds okay thanks yeah 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 my clock still shows 9 uh, seconds remaining so i'll finish it right so yeah so to conclude you know what we showed was uh, we uh, we are pursuing a regularized auto encoders as a powerful uh, as powerful alternatives to gyan kind of frameworks so because of the ease of training you know all our codes are made public <clears throat> you can run them and see that they are pretty simple to run you don't have to do too many high parameter tuning you still get good numbers dimensionality mismatch was one approach i mean one problem that we mathematically quantified and saw that uh, that that affects the quality of uh, regularized auto encoders you know uh, in in getting numbers that are comparable to gans uh, yeah we described two methods uh, one which masks the uh, su superfluous latent dimensions and uh, a method where you can learn the prior uh, uh, while you learn the auto encoders well, one important question you know one important direction that we are currently pursuing uh, which can be uh, what the public i mean pursuing is something called identifiability you know see having said all this we have still not said that the latent space that you are learning is exactly the one that is the generative latent space right <clears throat> all we are saying is you know the dimensionality will match and you will get a better divergence con i mean the optimal uh, number and all that but we are not saying that the the latent uh, distribution that the auto encoder is learning is exactly the latent distribution that the data was generated from so why is this important it is important because now people are talking about explainability right you know what do you mean by explainability if you know what factors generate data then your model automatically becomes explainable so one other dimension the direction that we are looking at is you know, how do you make this model identifiable in the sense that the latent distribution that you are learning is exactly the latent distribution that the data was generated from Okay, so with that note, I'll I'll conclude. Uh, and again, thank you for tolerating me for half an hour. I'll take questions. Maybe. Oh, so, so thank you, Pratish, for the great talk. And uh, so unfortunately, we are really out of time for questions now. There are a lot of interesting questions. If you could answer them on the uh, the questions panel, uh, that would be great. And uh, or in the chat panel. So one uh, uh, quick question would be: I mean, there are people who are asking about the relationship between dropouts and masking. If you could. Just say something about that very quickly, and then we can. Yeah. See, one, one, yeah. So one striking difference between dropout and masking is that the dropout is. I mean, if you if you are if you are talking of dropping out at one uh, layer, which is the bottleneck layer, dropout is done for weights. Now here we are dropping out the activations. You see, so the regular the mask that we have uh, proposed as a regularizer is an activity regularizer in the sense that it is being applied on the output of a layer, not on the weights. Right, so that is one fundamental difference between uh, dropout and mask, and there are uh, others, but yeah, that is one main difference. Okay. So, so thank you again, Pratosh, and if you could stay back and and uh, answer the questions on this session, uh, you have to go back to your old session to answer the questions. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, do we have a question answering session after uh, Professor Soma starts? Is that what? It is? No, we don't. We don't. So, I mean, there is a question panel on the right hand side of your interface. So, if you yeah. click on questions, you get that. So, there are questions posted there. You can answer them in the chat. In the chat. Uh, Oh, the chat interface. Oh. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the over opportunity. Yeah. yeah, over to you, Raj. Yeah, thank you, Pratosh. Uh, 
everyone we'll come back in uh, next couple of minutes with our uh, last talk uh, for this event